God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We want to thank God for another day. We want to bless the name of the Lord for another occasion, another moment, you know, to share the word of life, the word of truth. We want to bless the name of the Lord for this second day of this month's teaching seminar. Remember the theme since yesterday has been the new wine. And we want to appreciate as many as have called in those who sent a message, you know, uh, sharing how they were encouraged. In fact, a pastor called from uh, or sent a message from Europe. Permit me not to mention the particular location. He's a pastor of a church. He mentioned how the talk yesterday highly encouraged him and he learned a lot. And in fact, opened his eyes to one or two things. We want to bless the name of the Lord. You are encouraged, please, if by any chance you have been impacted in any one way or the other, you are free to share with us on our platforms, YouTube, Facebook, and Telegram. And God will bless you in the name of Jesus. Before we continue, can we just close our eyes and share a word of prayer? In Jesus' name, we pray. Father, we want to thank you for another moment. We want to thank you, Lord, for another time with you, even as we come together corporately. Time and space and distance are no barrier to you. Wherever your children are located all over the world, tune into this word of life, this, this day, this moment, we want to bless your holy name. The entrance of your word brings light, and that light is the life of men. We pray, Lord, that you illumine our heart and our mind, that by the direct teaching of your Holy Spirit, we will receive from you. Grant us open heavens. Grant us open hearts. Circumcise our ears and our intellect one more time. As you sit in throne over each and every one of us, let every contrary throne be the throne. At the end of it all, we shall be careful, very, very careful, to give you and you alone all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you one more time. Remember, our team has been the new wine. And yesterday we began by sharing you know, laying the foundation. We want to go ahead today, but before that, let's just look into the scriptures. We began by reading Matthew chapter 9 from verse 14 yesterday, but we will cut it uh, short today. We'll just take two verses for today. It's our anchor portion, Matthew chapter number 9. I will read only verses uh, 16 and 17 for today. This was the Lord answering a question. And then he, he made some one or two comments. Let's just take the end part of it. Verse 16, I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. And yesterday, as we were sharing, we also mentioned it's either new wine skins or renewed wine skins, and both will then be preserved and appropriate results will be gotten. Let's also look uh, at First Peter chapter 2. We referenced it yesterday, but let's just read it. You know it, and I know it, but let's just read it from the scriptures. Remember, I'm reading from the New International Version. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. It says, But you, you and I, the ecclesia, the church of God, but you, that you is a plural, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, or priests and kings, a royal priesthood, not just any type of priesthood. You. You and I, the Ecclesia, we are a chosen people of God, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We'll also look at verse 5 of that same chapter 2. Verse 5 says, you, plural also, also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, you see, that's a confirmation. Offering spiritual sacrifices, priests offer sacrifices. They give offering, they offer sacrifices. They represent God before the people. They represent people before God. 
unlike prophets who just go before God, hear from God, and tell the people. The other thing they may do is to intercede. But priests are pontifers. That's a Latin word meaning bridge. They connect one part of the bank of a river to another. So he said, we as spiritual priests, royal priests, we also offer spiritual sacrifices, not physical sacrifices. The sacrifice that was supposed to be physical has already been settled on Calvary. So we offer spiritual sacrifices. We'll come to that. We also referenced Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Let me just paraphrase it. God, sovereign Lord, cannot allow anything to happen without revealing it to his servants, the prophet. That is part of why he has even allowed what has been happening to stimulate us unto wholesome thinking, unto wholesome living, and to warn us of what is coming immediately after now. But let me also read from First Chronicles chapter 12. We referenced it yesterday. You know it, but let's just, just make a, a read from it. First Chronicles chapter number 12, verse 32. Men of Issachar who understood the times, number one, they understood the times, and they knew what Israel should do. They not only understood the times, they also knew what Israel should do. Praise the Lord. So as we continue today, we would just like to um, ask you, if you were not around with us yesterday, I will not be able to but, you know, summarize everything we see yesterday. We spoke for about one hour, 20 minutes or thereabouts. Well, as we go on today, I will just speak here and there so that we can be able to tidy up. You know, yesterday we began by saying so many things, lay the foundation, reference the season we are in, that we should not just look at the surface of things as we read yesterday from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, 8. Paul said, don't look at the surface of things. So we are not just looking at the situation purely on the uh, health level, pandemic. There are spiritual movements going on in the heavenly realms. And God had been warning his children that the world has entered into the first phase of the greatest spiritual battle the world has ever known. Why the enemy is using human beings he can manipulate to fast track his agenda because he knows his time is up. God has allowed it, purposely allowed it to stimulate us onto spiritual awareness and wakefulness so that we can wake up from spiritual slumber so that we can be simulated onto wholesome living and so that we can be prepared for what is about to follow because what god wants to do as we saw or read yesterday from romans chapter 9 verse 28 he said he would do it with speed and with finality daniel chapter 9 verse 26 27 said it will come like a flood so we have to be ready and it's out of god's grace that is helping us to be ready. So we laid the foundation on the somehow new wine and the, the new wine skins or old wine skins. What will happen if you put a new wine into old wine skins? It will burst. There will be a spoilage. Then there will be a loss. And then uh, that one will not be palatable. And uh, But we said that something new was coming in the offing. And uh, today we look at that something new, which we reference as the new wine. I just want to clear one or two things so that I will not be misunderstood. I will, not, or I will not also be misquoted. Praise the Lord. Now, number one point I want to expressly share and remind us, we should have known it, but it's proper for me to clear that point. The new wine is not a new type of teaching or a new doctrine. No, 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 no. The canon of scripture is already complete. So when we talk about new wine, we are not talking of a new revelation that is a new doctrine or whatever, you know, you may ascribe to that. The canon of scripture is already complete. The 66 books of the Bible is enough for us, not only for all other things, but everything we need for life and for godliness. God in his wisdom specifically chose those scriptures as he moved upon all those human beings he used as human scribes, about 40 of them spanning over 1,500 years. They lived at different points in time. Some of them were prophets, some kings, some were just uh, farmers like Amos, for example. Some of them were just ordinary human beings. They lived at separate times in separate locations in the Middle East, but their stories harmonized. And God chose the six books of the canon is enough for us, everything we need for life and for godliness. 
the redemption plan, the redemption purpose, the redemption pattern, and the redemption pursuit are all encompassed inside of it. But while this one is complete, while the canon of scripture is complete, remember Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 says, we should walk out, not walk for. Christ has already walked for our salvation. We should walk out our, that word translated salvation, the Greek word is sozo. Sozo does not just mean eternal life. It means seven things. It means healing, it means deliverance, it means um, victory, it means um, revelation, it means eternal life, yes, it means prosperity, it means spiritual web, it means seven things. So we will walk out, we should walk out this sozo, these seven facets of this word, sozo, with trembling and with fear, not to work for it. So that's the first point, that the, the new one is not a new teaching. It's not a new doctrine. Anybody who comes up with something outside the Bible, something is wrong. Number two, praise the Lord. I want to also mention, okay, see part of number one. Yesterday as we were sharing, we, we made mention of how God, after about 500 years, Christ had died, 500 AD, the church had gone to face degree apostasy and spiritual, I don't know what adjective to now use. So for the following 1,000 years, it was extreme depravity and apostasy in the church. Those 1,000 years are referred to as the Dark Ages. But after that, about 1517 AD, God now began to restore the fullness of what he wanted the ecclesia to be, but he did it in stages, stages of every 100 years, the later every 50 years, the later every 10 years. We detailed that a little bit yesterday from um, restoring back salvation by grace, not by works, through people like Martin Luther and Paul Kramer, then later through people like uh, the Wesley Brothers, Evangelism and Water, Baptism, then Holiness Movement, then the Pentecostal and Charismatic Movement in stages, then uh, the offices of the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, and later by around 1990, the office of the prophet, and before the end of the 2000, year, 2000 the office of the uh, apostle. So the fivefold ministries had been completed. Why God was doing this, he was not raising a new doctrine or a new emphasis or something new. All these things had already been there in the Bible, but God was only restoring what he wanted the church to know, revealing it and restoring it stage by stage. All along, each time he restores a particular stage, there will be a sort of um, a revival, revival of sorts. But those revivals were truncated from five angles. I mentioned those five angles. They were not adequate, usable vessels to conserve the food. For example, people adulterated it by demonic manipulation. Some turned it around for, 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 for financial. And again, there were church splits because people opposed the things that were new and all that and all that. We said so a lot yesterday. God was not bringing something new. He was only restoring something that had already been settled after the cross of Jesus Christ. So even though it fizzled out, we want to thank God that the next move of God now to complete all this thing will not be like it used to be because God never gets involved in an unfinished project. He never begins the thing without perfecting it. He knows why he even allowed it to be in stages. Now there is a new, something new to complete it. Number two point, number one point I said, the new wine is not new doctrine, no. It's not a new type of teaching, no. Number two point, the new wine is not a new effort by man to, to add to what Christ has done or what God wants us to do. Like uh, the household of uh, Abinadab had to construct a new cart to carry the ark of God. And then you will know the story, something went wrong, no. So the new wine is not a new effort by man to add to Christ's atoning sacrifice. No, no, no. What Christ has done is total, is complete, is permanent, is for all time, is for eternity. What Christ has done has satisfied every aspect of divine justice. There is nothing anybody can add to it. There is nothing anybody can remove from it. When Christ on the cross, at the end, just before he gave up the ghost, he cried out in the Greek, Tetelestai. It is Generally translated, it is finished. But classical Greek scholars tell us it is deeper than that because the Greek lexicon is richer than the, 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 
English lexicon. Totalized time means totally total, completely complete, permanently permanent, fully paid. Nothing anybody can add to it, nothing anybody can remove from it. So everything that Christ did has already satisfied divine justice in its fullness. See, in the spiritual realm, the spiritual realm accommodates number one, legality, number two, legislation, and number three, justice. I will take that again. The spiritual realm accommodates legality. And Satan knows that. That's why, in spite of everything, trickery, seduction, enticement, and those, he operates on legal grounds. He has to have a hold, which is part of what Christ was telling us. You cannot enter into a strong man's house and loot, except you remove that thing that gives him vent. So Satan will first of all find out a legal basis before he can place anybody legally in bondage. The spiritual realm, I'll, I'll take that again, accommodates legality, accommodates legislation, accommodates justice. And so God was very careful that what Christ did covered every part of divine justice. The spiritual realm has court systems in the godly part, in the demonic part. In fact, that is why these things we call a cause or an imprecation. A cause cannot work an imprecation cannot be effective upon anybody it is sent out to unless there has been a verdict in a spiritual court of competent jurisdiction. So for a cause, for example, to work, for an imprecation to begin to work on anybody, there has to be a verdict. The spiritual court has to sit together and there will be a verdict. Even if that occultic man threatens you or whatever, just to put fear so that you can open your spirit up, don't worry. If there is no basis, even when they meet in their court, if there is no positive verdict supporting him, that cause will not work. And the verdict is based upon, number one, an infringement. Number two, a trespass. Number three, disobedience to the word of God. If there is no infringement, if there is no trespass, if there is no disobedience to the word of God, when the money cause meets, there will be no verdict. So the cause cannot rest. That is why... Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2 says, A curse, costless, cannot come to rest. It can hover like a sparrow, like a fluttering sparrow or the other type of bird, Bible mentioned, but it cannot rest. And that is why we have to be very, very careful about committing sin and living in sin. Satan cannot hold anybody in bondage. Every curse from the mouth of Satan is witch doctors, you know, clairvoyants, sorcerers, avatars, whatever that title they carry, whatever level they reach, that cause cannot rest except there has been an infringement. And demonic cause have met and passed the verdict, then they can be sure it will happen. So we have to be careful. Satan, God, even though Christ disrobed him, disarmed him, the Greek word is apekoyo. Christ rendered him useless. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. The Greek word is katagio. Even though Christ has disarmed the enemy, undress him, the, 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 the archangel robe he had, even though he has rendered him useless, but Satan's God has still allowed him the ability to entice, to tempt, to seduce, and then to prosecute you, make you feel guilty, and then accuse you and prosecute you. He will tell God, you see, this one, this is what he has done. I will take that again. Satan still has the ability to attempts, the ability to seduce, the ability to entice, the ability to accuse. The Bible calls him accuser of the brethren, not just not even unbelievers. And then after accusing you, making you feel guilty, he will prosecute you. So a cause, an imprecation cannot rest unless there has been an infringement, a trespass or disobedience to the word of God. And the enemy knows this. So that's why he operates on legal grounds, even covenants. So when you're talking about demonic covenants. Today is not the time for that. A demonic covenant cannot be effective upon somebody who, who has been sanitized, washed with the blood of Jesus Christ, his sins forgiven, forgotten. And if I remind you again, justification, just as if you had not sinned. The, 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 the legal man will say, discharge and acquitted. When the Supreme Judge of the Supreme Court of the universe discharges and acquits you on the basis of what Christ has done, then no demonic court can have jurisdiction over your life. 
So that is why we have to be careful. And that was why God himself made sure that the price that Jesus Christ paid satisfied every aspect of divine justice. So that when he's defending his own, he's defending it you know, convincingly without going contrary to his word. Praise the Lord. So the, the new wine is not a new doctrine. It's not a new teaching. It's not any effort by any man to add to what Christ has done. No, 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 no. It is just, we are going to break it down into three. We may take only one or two today. Tomorrow we tidy up. That is why, as we were saying yesterday, the, 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 the revival that is coming will not be a one-man affair. It's not the effort of man. It's going to be a company of Elijah's. And I explained that yesterday. So the new wine, point three, major point number three today, the new wine is, there are three phases, I will take one. The new wine is the fullness. And that is going to be the one that will top it up. That's why it's going to be the end of it all. The fullness of the revelation and restoration of the ecclesia. The ecclesia is the church. They called our people. There is an intended purpose of which what, what God wants to do. We are going to mention that later. The ultimate purpose. And so while God has been restoring things about the body of Christ stage by stage, now we are coming to come to the fullness of God restoring that upon the church so that the church will manifest, you know, God's intended purpose and praise and glory to God. That's why we yesterday were emphasizing that the whole of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the true sons of God, not just churchgoers. Not just uh, uh, nominal Christianity, not the rituals and ceremonies. No, 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 no. They are true sons of God that will soon be made manifest. And what is going to happen is predicated upon what Christ is doing now. He has already finished the work of redemption. What Christ is doing now, we know it from the scriptures. He is at the right hand of the Father occupying the office of the Christus, that's the Christ, the Messiah, and administrating. He is there as the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. The high priest in the order of Melchizedek, interceding at a level that man may not have ordinarily attained, and God wants us to key in into that. He settled in that greatest but hidden ministry. It's the greatest ministry. Christ was on earth upon so I'm a prophet, teacher, pastor, everything. And the Bible said, as he ascended, he shared, you know, this grace in peace to each and every one of us. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father. The Father said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And that is what is going to happen very soon. And so God is looking for fire carriers, those who will be qualified to operate at that realm, even while we are on earth. So the office of the Christus, the high priest office of Christ in the order of Melchizedek, doing intercession at a level that man may not have known before. We need to key in up into that so that we will no more be operating at the judicial level of when we pray, we are either petitioning or supplicating and pleading. No, God wants us to operate at the level of authoritative prayers. The Greek word is eiteo. At that level, you declare, you decree, you demand. And it will happen if, you, if we play our parts well. Remember, there are principles, if I may use that word, for us to fulfill. Everything God does is at that level. Let, let me just give you a, a, a general example. Christ died for everybody on earth. Man, woman, poor, rich. Small, 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 small boy, rich person, or my big person, the believer and unbeliever. The death of Jesus Christ was for everybody. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But those who have gained that portion and those who have received him believe in his name. That's what what the Bible says. Others, unbelievers who have not received him, who have not believed in his name, they are not benefiting from salvation. Even though Christ has died for each and every one of us. The same thing for other aspects of Christianity. Deliverance, for example, you have to change camp from the camp of the enemy. You have to learn how to serve the enemy, quick notice in warfare, and serve him a, 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 a termination paper. You have to do it. You have to present the receipt exam Christ has already won for us. That was why in Exodus chapter 12, 
God told each family in Israel to kill a lamb. But he didn't end there. He said, let each family take the blood and apply. The, our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, has already been crucified, but we need to learn how to apply the blood. There are also principles for prosperity. There are also principles for multiplication, for fruitfulness. So if we just say we are born again, all things are passed, we'll be missing it. I'm just giving that general example, which I believe you know. So we need to key in upon this. And incidentally, as I said yesterday, it has already been resolved for us. Not that God is just doing it now. Everything that Christ has done took care of it. Bible tells us he died for us. He set us free from every language, every tribe, every nation to make us a kingdom of priests. There is the priesthood in the order of Aaron or the Levitical priesthood under the, the, the period of Moses. There is the priesthood of Jesus Christ in the order of Melchizedek, which we are operating now, which took root right from the priesthood that, uh, that, that existed before the law was given. I want you to take note of that, before the law was given. Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 that the law that was introduced 430 years after did not cancel that covenant of promise God made to Abraham and his seed. In fact, when we talk about tithe, for example, tithe is not an Old Testament precept in the sense of if we understand Old Testament. Old Testament has two broad parts. The period of promise, the patriarchs, is different from the period of the law and Moses. Take, take note of that. It's separate. Tithe did not start from the law. Tithe was already paid by Abraham in the period of the patriarchs. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 7, Christ, who is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek, Abraham had paid tithe to him back in Genesis chapter 14. So the law was just came in for about seven reasons I mentioned some yesterday. It was also like a remedial cause. Now that the real thing has gone, has come, the law has ended. Christ is the end of the law for all who begin. We are back again to that era of promise and grace. That's where we are rooted. In Christ, we are that seed of Abraham. It's in the Bible, Galatians chapter 3. May Lord help us to appreciate in Jesus' name. So we, we, we need to key into that. We need to understand that we are a kingdom of priests, kings and priests. And until we take up that mantle again, understand it. The, the, the priesthood is something that most Christians have not appreciated. And it has placed many Christians in a disadvantaged form. And that's what God wants us to recognize. Because when the church of God understands this, church militant, church triumphant, then church will be glorified. The ecclesia has to complete why God created it. He called our people. So it's upon that platform. And like I said yesterday, I want to re-emphasize it. Priesthood, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. I'm putting only the New Testament so that you will not say, I'm talking about Old Testament. These are New Testament precepts. Then in the Bible, we are kings and priests, and many of us don't know that. Priesthood, especially the New Testament priesthood, is the technology for kingdom dominion. If not, you will be enduring your Christianity instead of enjoying it. Priesthood is the platform on which you can control territories. If you don't understand what I am saying, which God wants to now bring to full play, you miss it. A brother was sharing um, 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 somewhere. Permit me not to mention the name of the brother. It's somebody well known. I, I just happened to come across that someone. And he was given an example. If, okay, he asked a question rhetorically. Why would a, a girl that has been born in a Christian family, strong Christian parents, and then uh, this, that, and that, that, and that, that, that girl or boy was even strong in the local congregation he or she was attending. They let him just enter university. The first year, he or she might keep himself. The second year, you see the girl wearing mini skirts and all sorts of nonsense. The third year, she has become a third degree prostitute. Because she, nobody told her any territory you enter, you are a priest. You have to have territorial control. Am I talking to somebody? A boy that comes from a Christian family, well behaved, he was strong even in the youth wing of the church. Let him just enter, say, university, a new territory. Because there are spirits in every territory. And God has created us to be kingdom dominators, to be territorial Christians, to control territories. The boy just 
you know, gets interested in cultism. Before you know it, he has become something else. What I am saying is serious business. Take note, I want to reemphasize, I'm not preaching a new doctrine. I am not adding to what Christ has already done. No. The new wine that God wants to pour will also need, as we're saying yesterday, new structures, vessels that will be qualified to carry it. Christ said, if you don't bring the appropriate vessel, the vessel will burst, the wine will spill, there will be a loss. And God is so too wise for that, especially in this end time, at this conclusion of the dispensation of man on earth. So priesthood is the platform for kingdom dominion. Priesthood of the believer, I'm not talking of the priesthood of Christ, we'll log into that, he's our high priest, he is there, he's there. But we have to recognize our position in Christ, who we are in Christ, what we need to do in Christ, our responsibilities in Christ, and our authority. Can you, can you imagine Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, God said, part of his reason is so that we will teach the powers of evil in the spiritual realms. His multifaceted wisdom. Check it in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. God wants to use you and I to teach the princes, the principalities, the thrones and dominions in the atmospheric and cosmic realms, the multifaceted wisdom of God. Can you imagine that? And the church is still sleeping. If heaven wants to use you and I to teach the powers of darkness, the, the very gates of hell, the word prince, the Greek word is archon, one that has jurisdiction over a territory. Every territory has a demonic entity, either at the prince level or principality or throne or dominion. They are well organized. The organogram is well organized. You don't just enter into a territory, a new workplace, a new town, a new residence, a university outfit, but whatever, any institution is just relaxed. That is why many Christians are enduring their Christianity. That is why many Christians are not enjoying their Christianity. They are asking God why. They know there is more, like I said last month's teaching. There is more, but where is the more? And God is now about pouring that new one. And it's not for every vessel. I want to reemphasize that. It's not for every human being that even goes to church. It's not for any, any human being that has just, you know, because you have received Christ and you say, oh, things are passed away. No, there is something God expects you and I to do to come to that position where we can decree, where we can declare, where we can demand a thing. Let, let me give you an example I've given before. I don't know whether you heard me say that. In John chapter 12, John chapter 14, verse 12, 13, for that's where you first of all see Christ use that word, eiteo. Remember, that was the last night before he went to the cross. So he was speaking deep things to the body of Christ, then the disciples, even though he told them they will not appreciate it fully, until he goes and sends the Holy Spirit who will give illumination and teach us all things. But he, he was giving them a little bit of the appetizer. He said, you are going to do much more than I'm doing. And when Peter understood that, and when he, he got to a level he could appropriate it, when they met that crippled man who was at the um, um, beautiful gate, Acts chapter 3, Peter did not petition. Read that story again. Peter does not supplicate. He, he, they, they, there's nothing that could have been wrong if he had done that, if he had laid down and said, Father, you know you said in so so and so by the scribe, 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 scribe of Jesus Christ, stripes of Jesus Christ, where this man is healed and all that and all that. He would have been um, 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 supplicating, Father, please heal him, have pity. No, he didn't do that. He said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. He held the man's hand, drew him up. He didn't petition. He didn't supplicate. He ate it. He declared it. He decreed it. He demanded it. And the spiritual realm honored it. When, if you don't understand priesthood and act on it, something will be fundamentally wrong. You will be operating at a disadvantage, especially now that the enemy has come down because he knows his time is up. And we have said it many, many times. Bible refers to us as a kingdom of priests, holy priesthood. Kings and priests. The word ecclesia means called our people. It also means pontifers. It also means legislators. We are supposed to repeal negative laws. We are supposed to declare laws. But look at how it works. So whatever you declare on earth, you agree. The ecclesia, not one person. The word ecclesia is always in the plural. 
never one person. So the, the minimum is two. Whenever any two or more of you gather, so it's ecclesia has formed. Wherever, whenever, wherever, whenever the ecclesia gathers, whatever you bind on earth would have been bound in heaven. It is there in the heavenly realms, waiting for us to download it. And only priests do that. The priestly anointing comes before the kingly anointing. I'll say that again. We are priests. We are kings of, and priests. But the priestly anointing comes before the kingly anointing. And it's only when we understand priesthood that we can operate at this rate. If not, we'll be operating at a disadvantage. It doesn't matter how many years you've been born again. Yesterday, I shared a little bit of my own story. In fact, I was referred back after the talk is referred back to two servants of the Lord, well known in this country. They, they gave this testimony you know, publicly on, on YouTube, I, but for some reason I will not mention their name, but they gave this testimony themselves. In fact, that is the, the Lord referenced me back to it, and I, it was like I, I, I listened to it again. One of them is a well known you know, man of God, servant of God that God has been using. He said it happened to him also. It happened to him in his family. People usually have problems at the age of 21. We are not now talking about ancestral or generational sins or whatever anybody did in the past. No. At the age of 21, I think if I remember the sequence of the story, his elder brother got mad. Maybe he was 21, the university. The second one, you know, at the age of 21, the intelligent boy that was doing medicine or something, I think medical, you know, medical um, 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 course, and then suddenly, an, an incurable disease that doctors could not diagnose even when it was taken abroad and it came up. The third one ran mad. The fourth one, it was like that. He was the fifth. And he said in the campus, he had gained admission exactly at the age of 21. He had been serving God before he entered in, in that campus. He had, he, God has been using him, you know, some signs and wonders and miracles and healing. God has been, he, it wasn't that he was an unbeliever. But he didn't understand priesthood. He said in the university campus here in this country, he, you know how universities are always busy? In a pathway that people should have been busy at that period of day, but he said, for, for whatever reason, that moment, there was nobody. He was only the only person. But it didn't bother him. But as he was just going, exactly that day, he clocked 21. As he was just going, a bed, a very mighty, frightening, non-discreet bed suddenly appeared before him. Not that it walks from somewhere. It just suddenly appeared before him. He said the bed was so frightening. Fear almost gripped him. But he remembered who he was in Christ. By then he had started understanding one or two things about you know, the dynamics of the Holy Spirit, which I'm, I've been sharing, which I'm going to mention a little bit today or tomorrow. So he said, in order not to allow fear to grip him, he closed his eyes and began to speak in tongues in capital letters. In fact, he was the first person I heard use this phrase, that he spoke in tongues in capital letters. Do you know what it means to speak in tongues in capital letters? He was trying to describe the level he had to go in the spiritual realm. He spoke in tongues in capital letters. And he said when he opened his eyes, one wing of the beast big bed had broken and the bed had to limp into the bush. Soon after that, his uncle died. And before he died, he confessed that he was the one that has been doing that to the family. So, three lessons. Number one, it's not always ancestral, generational, thing because you might say, you know, I'm born again, all things are passed away. And No, it's not always that. Wicked people, demonic agents, somebody who was close, an uncle, taking the lives of his younger brother, his elder brother, the life of the children of his elder brother. Four people had gone. The second lesson we might pick from that, you know, from that, apart from that, it's not always about ancestral things and all that and all that. The second lesson I pick from that, even though the enemy could not get him because of the mark of Jesus Christ upon his forehead and the right he has as a child of God, but they still tried. The third lesson, as he said, God now revealed to him, even though you are my servant, but I've made you a priest to take Charge over a territory, a place under, under your still worship, including your family. Just almost parallel with what I shared yesterday. So it, it now occurred to him that he is not just a child of God. He's not just a servant of God. He's not just one that God will be using to bless other people. 
He was also, and still is, because the person I'm talking about is still alive. God is using him mightily in this country. He was also supposed to be a priest over his family. He was the fifth son in that family. But it was him that God chose. So don't say, I'm not the first son, I'm not the first daughter. No. And in fact, just like it happened to me, he began to regret. Who knows? If he had known what he then knew, who knows whether he would have prevented the premature death and the premature catastrophe of you know, disastrous health problems that came upon his siblings and even his mother. Who knows? My brother, my sister, you are a royal priest. And we are linked to the priesthood of Jesus Christ, whose priesthood is eternal in the order of Melchizedek. And it's at the right hand of the Father now. We need to link up. We need to link up to become everything that God wants us to be. If not, we will be operating at a disadvantage. It is a journey to a realm. That's why the Bible said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, that God made us alive in Christ and raised us up to be with him in the heavenly realms. But some of us are still at the earth realm. Some of us here think we are physical beings struggling to live a spiritual life. No, we are rather spiritual beings in an earth suit placed here on earth to reign and to rule on behalf of heaven. I'll take that again. We are not physical beings struggling to live a spiritual life. It will lead to frustration. It, 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 will, it will lead to stress. And, and before you know it, my burnout and thin out and even backslide. We are not physical beings. We are spiritual beings created in the image of God. His image, the Hebrew word is selem, T-S-E-L-E-M. His attributes, his nature, his characteristics. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 says, when God said, let there be light. That was the glory of God, the light of God, the life of God coming out of the face of this Christ and unto us. And he said, verse 7, we are clay containers carrying that treasure. There is something inside. That is who we really are. Let me remind you what I said last one. I said yesterday. That's why Elijah, whom we are supposed to be operating in the spirit and power, could confront Ahab and said, in the name of Jehovah, before whom I stand. That is when you begin to understand Genesis chapter 3 verse 9, when God asks Adam, where are you? When God asked that question, he was not looking for information. I mean, he's omniscient. He was only making Adam to know something has gone wrong in the spiritual realm. The seed God placed before him for Adam so that they can koinonia in the spiritual realm so that God can give him revelation, insight, understanding, telling things he, he didn't know. Remember, Adam was not born as a child, grew up. He was created an adult. God was coming to teach him. Adam missed that seat when he committed high treason. And that's why in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, after God had restored Joshua the high priest, verse 6 said, I now charge you, if you will keep my ways, take note of that. There are ways, pathways in the spirit. If you keep my ways and obey my commandments, I will make you in charge of my courts. And you will have a place among those who stand before me. Hallelujah. You will have a place among those who stand before me. There is a place in the spiritual realm God has for you. There is a place in the spiritual realm God, God has for me. And because we, most of us are see, operating in ignorance, he wants us to come to that fullness. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Bible said, I'm paraphrasing it, that Christ, while he was on earth, had the whole of the Godhead in bodily form in him. The whole of the Godhead. Verse 10 says, in Christ, we also have that fullness. Hey! In Christ, we have the whole of the fullness of the Godhead in us. It is a spiritual location. It is a place. And it takes a journey. When you get to that location, that is when you can deprogram demonic programming, programming into your life. If you are now born again, programming into your family members as the priest of that family, you cannot occupy. You come to a territory, you can now have dominion. 
You enter an institution, you sit on a new office, you have been promoted, you don't know who sat there before, what he had invoked, what he uses to fortify himself, what he's using to prevent another person coming there. You just go and sit. No, my brother, my sister, you have to dominate. And you don't do that at the ground level. There are four levels of spiritual authority. We had given a teaching on that. Number one, exousia. The day, the day you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Bible says God gives you exousia. Some translation with power. No, it's not actually power. It is the right, just a right to be called a child of God. Just a right. That's the first level of spiritual authority. Second level, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You shall receive power. The Greek word is dunamis. So you have exousia, just a right. You have dunamis, power. But power, potential power. It is inherent. I will give you a new spirit and I will give you my spirit to help you. So at that level, but it is dormant. It is potential. It's left for you to do. If you know what to do, then that potential power will now change to kinetic power or functional power. If not, it is there. Like somebody said, you know, the Christ was in the boat with disciples, but he was sleeping. <laughs> they had to wake him. So God, there's a problem. So he's inheriting you. The, the third level of spiritual authority is energy. I had given a teaching on that. Let me not go back to it. The fourth level is curious. So we have exousia. Some people are just at that level. We, we have dunamis. Some people have come there and they are just satisfied there. But that's the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues. No, my brother, don't end there. They have energy. They have curious. The level that Paul reached, his handkerchief, his apron, could heal the sick. The level that Peter eventually got to, his shadow, could heal the sick. The level Joshua, even though under the old covenant, managed at least for that moment to reach, he could not speak to the elements. The sun, the cosmic realm, stood still for 24 hours for a man. Bible said, before then and since after then, no man has been able to do that. The whole of the solar system stood still for him. Curious. When you know what to do and arise to that level of priesthood, then that potential or the energy level will now be converted to Greek word kratos. It is that level of kratos that you will be able to intercept the plan of the enemy and interchange it with the plan of God. That's why God said, I live in a high and lofty place. He said, Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3, call unto me. Now, listen very well. That, that, that phrase is not shout upon me. Hey God, are you there? No. He said, call unto me. Call upon me. It's like somebody say, call upon me tomorrow. He's saying, come to my house. God saying, come, call, call to, come to my level. Come to my realm. Call upon me to my level, my house. I live in a high and lofty place. Then he said, I will show you deep and unsearchable things you do not know about yourself, about your family, about your kindred, about your residence, about your business, about your environment, about that school you have just gained admission to, about that place you have just had a walk. Call upon me. Come to that level. Key in into the priesthood level of my son, Jesus Christ, the Christus. He's now the administrator. Key in. And I will reveal to you things that you cannot think about. You never, that's how the Amplified Bible puts it. Things you never even thought of. Things you cannot even imagine. Things you cannot even understand. Except I show you. It's at that level that you can legislate. Things that will have effect on the earth. And that is the level God wants to restore back the church. The priesthood. My brother, my sister, priesthood is very, very important. If you don't understand it, you cannot operate seriously. You'll be at, an, at a disadvantage. You cannot operate at the level God wants you to operate. You cannot become all that God wants you to become. But God wants us to get to that level. And may the Lord help us to understand in Jesus' name. It's at that level, like I said before, church militant. Then church becomes triumphant. Then church will become glo no, no, glorified. Then when we get there, at that level, we know that we're called up. I gave a, one or two examples, you know, last month's teaching. But let me, let me remind, remind you one or two of them. You see, when Jacob placed a curse upon his son Reuben, because of the patriarchal, the, the, the Abrahamic blessing that passed through Isaac and unto him, and he spoke that blessing and then placed a curse upon Reuben, and limited him. He said, you, 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 you cannot excel. But when Moses got to a level that he was speaking with God face to face, he canceled it. 
when Joshua placed a curse on Jericho, he said, any man that begins to build the wall of the city again, his first son will die. By the time he completes it, his last son will die. It happened. One man tried it, and the Bible tells us that it happened. His first son died. By the time he completed Jericho wall again, his last son, all of them had died to the last one. That curse remained there until Elisha, Elisha who asked God for a double portion above what Elijah had. Elisha could ascend, and the Bible said he didn't even need to shake his body. He just told them, bring me water from, that, from the, the river. The brother said, put some, to go and pour it back. That curse over Jericho was broken. There are demonic powers operating over situations, over territories, over kindreds, over families. Let's not go into the theology of how it came and now that you are born again, whether you are still under that, you can know. But God can, is telling us to arise so that we can come to a level we're operating above them. We cancel what they have done. It may not be for you per se because you are a child of God and by God's grace you are being covered. But suppose God demands of you on that day, call forward and give an account of the stewardship I place under you, your family, your territory, your community. Call forward and give an account of what I committed into your hands. My brother, my sister, rituals and ceremonies and all the routine in our the body of Christ now, my brother, my sister, that is dead religion. I know that some people may not be happy when I repeat this thing, but you cannot make a treatment without making a proper diagnosis. Then you now introduce the treatment. Shouting and screaming without having priestly anointing to exercise the kingly power, the kingly anointing. Shouting and screaming and maybe even crying. It does not excite the enemy. He will even be laughing. If you just go, even in your prayer closet and you are just there whimpering, crying, comparing yourself to say, God, you blessed Michael. You have not blessed me. You gave a uh, so personal. No, the enemy will just be laughing. In fact, they will be joking with it. They say, you know, um, stage one of phase three of the drama. And the demons will touch you again. You cry and cry again. It does not excite the enemy. In fact, it just makes him happy. Rules and regulations alone in your life, in your children, those under you, just make those rigid rules and regulations. Even in the church, rules and regulations doesn't just work. I was giving a talk somewhere. I brought out this issue. It will only lead to one of two things. Hypocrisy. People will just obey those rules and regulations just to please the pastor. Just to please their father, just to please their mother, just to please the, their, their guardian, the person uh, about hypocrisy. Or if it doesn't produce hypocrisy, it will produce rebellion. They say, this one is too much. You see that child behave. No, but if something happens inside, if the person knows his or her right, who he is, and is able to log in, Kratos will become manifest. Priesthood at that level will be, you know, decreeing things that will have effect on, 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 on earth realm. Things that even the world will begin to imagine. Even people around you will begin to wonder what is happening. What is happening? They wouldn't have known that you have gotten to a level. The Bible tells us in, in Hebrews chapter 12 that when the ecclesia, when, when the ecclesia takes up its rightful position, we have come to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is not a physical thing. It's a 